Hey guys, today I'm gonna to take you through some clinical pearls in diabetes management. I'm doing my endocrine rotation right now, so I feel it would be a good time to review diabetes. Let's go through some clinical pearls, and this is just a little accumulation of fun facts on diabetes that are key to remember in uh, hospital management of diabetes. So drugs to look out for in diabetics. Sulfonylureas are a big one. They're easily able to bring a patient into hypoglycemia, so especially when in the hospital setting, when patients are eating less, a lot of them are NPO status, the glucose can drop and it can drop dangerously low on sulfonylureas. And especially watch out for this if there's kidney damage, if there's AKI, because the drug will build up in the system. Thiazolinedions are known to cause volume overload. That's one of their side effects. And if you have, for example, a heart failure patient who's already volume overloaded, you don't want to make it worse and take away the thiazolinedion. Metformin is the classic one. Everybody knows it can cause lactic acidosis, especially if it builds up in the system. And since metformin, again, is excreted via the kidney, anyone with AKI or contrast-induced uh, nephropathy from IV contrast can suffer uh, that side effect. So watch out for metformin, especially with kidney damage. So check the creatinine, check the GFR. Next we have uh, nutrition. So nutrition in the patients in the hospital is enteral or parenteral. So you can easily uh, provide overnutrition to a hospitalized patient, especially if they're in the ICU and can't talk to you. And also dextrose can do this. It's one of the common fluids used. And those can bring the patients into a hyperglycemic state. Steroids can do this as well. And a lot of people are on steroids for autoimmune conditions or inflammatory conditions. COVID right now, steroids are being used everywhere. Next, we have uh, how do you treat someone with a low glucose? So uh, for example, if you accidentally give them too much insulin or if they come in from an insulin overdose, a lot of suicide attempts are done with excess insulin. What do you do for that? Well, you, you have to give glucagon because glucagon is gonna cause gluconeogenesis. It's gonna bring those levels back up as well as IV dextrose because it acts a little bit faster, you're giving glucose straight into the system. So glucagon is dosed at 0.03 milligrams per kilogram, and it's usually given for very low blood sugars, something under 50, for example. Then another thing to be cognizant of is sodium values change based on the glucose numbers. So if you have someone with a very high glucose, the sodium that's gonna be on their blood report will most likely be inaccurate. And how that works is, for every 100 glucose that uh, it goes above normal. So if the glucose is 200, you have to adjust the sodium by 1.6. So I'm bringing the sodium, uh, this, because glucose is osmotically active, it's going to dilute out the sodium and it's gonna cause it to drop. So you have to compensate for that by adding 1.6 to the sodium number. So if I have a 200 glucose, I'm adding 1.6 to my sodium to get the real number in the system. And NPO patients still require insulin. So even though NPO patients are not eating, there's a basal requirement for insulin that's needed in all patients, even though it's a little bit less for them since, again, they're not eating. And that'll be 50 to 75% of their basal that they usually take at home. So it's a little bit of a myth that NPO patients don't require insulin. Here are some target glucose ranges for general patients and ICU patients. So uh, I have preprandial, which is before eating and random glucose numbers that uh, usually are the goal for, glu for glucose management and diabetes management on the floors. And then ICU, it's a little bit higher, 140 to 180. And that's just because you wanna be very careful. You don't want lows in the ICU. You already have enough problems to deal with. So. Uh, highs are a little bit more tolerated. And this is again, patient dependent. Uh, for example, if you have a very critically ill patient who's in just, uh, you know they're going to go to a hospice care, they're in the end stages of life and you just want comfort, then you might tolerate very high glucose levels if they're comfortable at those levels and you don't want them low and uncomfortable because with lows you can get, anx you get anxiety, you get a lot of uncomfortable effects. You feel it when your blood glucose is low. Here are some insulin types and they're organized based on the, how fast they act and their duration. So uh, the rapid acting insulins are lisproglulosine and aspart, and they are given usually before meals. They're your bolus insulins. 
Then we have intermediate acting and slow acting insulins, NPH, glargine, and detimer, which are given as your basal insulins. And those are your maintenance insulins that are given usually once a day, multiple times a day if you're using, for example, NPH. And a key thing that you can use just to visually distinguish them is that NPH is going to be cloudy. So if you have a clear container, NPH will be your cloudy insulin. The other two are going to look clear. So you have to make sure to read the bottle very carefully. All right. Um, people measure their insulin in diff uh, their glucose in different ways. So uh, patients usually start out with a glucometer, especially type two diabetics. These are the finger prick machines that measure the glucose in the blood. And uh, more ingenious and uh, interesting machines have recently been invented called continuous glucose monitors. And they're under different brand names like Freestyle Libre and Dexcom G6. Um, these are these look like this middle picture here, this little stub. And what happens here is there's a, a needle that goes inside the skin with a probe. And the probe is left in the interstitial space just under the skin. And that transmits data to your phone. Um, there's an app on your phone. And when you, for example, in the freestyle, when you bring your phone close to the monitor, it will tell you your blood sugar. Now that works is in the interstitial space. There's a glucose oxidase reaction that gets converted to an electrical signal. That electrical signal is picked up by the sensor and then sent to your phone. So a couple differences here. Freestyle Libre, you have to actually tap the sensor with either your phone or a monitor to get the numbers. So it's called a flash glucose monitor. It doesn't continuously update. Dexcom G6 automatically every five minutes sends a glucose to your phone. Uh, Medtronic also makes one called the Guardian, which they pair with their uh, insulin pump called the 670G. We'll talk about that in just a second. And then there's an Eversense monitor, which is actually implanted under the skin, and that lasts for a longer time. So these continuous glucose monitors, they don't last forever. They last up to 10 to 14 days. So every 10 to 14 days, you need to pull it out and then replace it. Um, and the company usually sends you some sensors for that, but it's a lot more convenient than constantly having to prick your finger and you get a lot more readings and a lot more data than the glucometer. It is a little bit less accurate. So the glucometer is the gold standard because it takes the glucose from the blood instead of the interstitial space. So it's gonna be the most accurate for rapid fluctuations, but for day-to-day -day use, CGMs are excellent tools. And then we can briefly talk about glucose pumps. So the two main ones that are made right now are by Medtronic and Tandem Control IQ. And Tandem has a deal with Dexcom and Medtronic creates its own uh, sensor. So here on the bottom, we see an insulin pump. This delivers insulin to the patient from a vial attached to the pump. And then on the other side of the abdomen, we see the glucose sensor. So this creates kind of a closed loop system. So for example, if we're taking Dexcom G6 here on the right side of on the right side of the image we have a sensor it's sending the data to the tandem control IQ insulin pump here on the left and that distributes insulin as needed in order to regulate blood sugars so it's it's basically a closed loop system also known as an artificial pancreas which is really cool next we have some little bit of insulin math so some basic calculations that are good to know for managing diabetics. The first thing you need to do is calculate total daily insulin. And this is done using the patient's weight. So you can take their weight in pounds and divide it by four, or you can do 0.4 units per kilogram. And this is going to give you the total units a patient will use in one day. And off of that, you can calculate their basal insulin requirement. So usually people calculate 40 to 50%. Most people I know, uh, they go for 50. So 50% of your TDI or total daily insulin, which you calculated on the weight, is going to go to your basal. And the other 50 is going to go to your bolus, right? So to get your basal insulin, that's how you need the total daily insulin. And then you do half of that. Now to get the bolus, it's a little bit um, more tricky. So bolus insulin is based on carbs. When, when you give a bolus, you're giving the insulin, the rapid acting insulin to compensate mm -hmm for carbohydrates in a meal. So you're gonna to need to know how much insulin to give for how much carbs, and that's called a carb ratio. To calculate that, you do 500 divided by the total daily insulin dose. And then you use that number, that's your carb ratio, and you multiply it by the carbs in order to know how much insulin to give for a specific meal. 
and that's your bol bolus insulin. Then we have something called a correction factor. This is not for meals. This is just if you're going too high before a meal. So before any time of day, you can give something called a correction factor, and that'll bring down your sugars if they're too high to a normal level. And how to calculate that is the rule of 1800, which is 1800 divided by your total daily insulin will show you how strong of an impact one unit of insulin will have on your blood sugars in milligrams per deciliter. So let's run through an example. Let's say we have a 160 pound patient and now we divide by four, which is gonna give us 40 total daily insulin units. So that's how much a patient uses in a day. Now, 20 of that is gonna be basal insulin. So that's gonna be our long acting insulins, glargine, detimer, or NPH, okay? So the rest of that, the rest 20 is going to be used in our bolus. But to calculate bolus, each bolus is individual. So we have to use our carb ratio, which is going to be 500 divided by our total daily insulin, 40, giving us 12. So we know that for 12 grams of carbs, we give one unit of insulin. So if we have a 24 gram carb meal, we know we're giving two units for that meal. And this also applies to snacks. And then we have our correction factor. So our correction factor is 1800 divided by 40, which is 45 milligrams per deciliter. So I know that if I'm 200 glucose, when I measure and I need to come down, if I give myself one unit of insulin, I'll come down by 45. So I would, you, in that case, I would give myself one, one and a half, maybe two units in order to come down to a normal glucose of 100, 120, okay? So here are basal insulins, just for your, your reminder, and here are our bolus insulins. And let's go on to our final slide, which is talking about sliding scale and basal bolus or intensive insulin therapy. They're, they're mentioned by different names at different places. So how do you, what is a sliding scale and why do some places not like it? So when a patient comes into the hospital and they're managed for their diabetes inside the hospital, uh, they need to be given insulin before every meal and their glucose needs to be managed. So as a patient in the hospital, what am I going to do when I'm on a sliding scale? First thing I'm going to do is before a meal, I'm going to take my blood sugar measurement. Okay. Then I'm going to apply my correction factor to bring me down to a normal level. So let's say I need one unit as my correction factor. And then I know I'm going to be eating a meal. So on top of that unit, I have to add more insulin to compensate for the carbohydrates in the meal. And that insulin is assigned to me by the hospital because they give a standard insulin amount for every meal. So I have my correction factor plus the hospital insulin dose. And I do that for every meal. So the only thing I control is the correction factor. That's the only thing I need to calculate. And then I add that to the hospital insulin and that's how I dose my insulin for the bolus. I do also have a basal one that's given, okay? So bolus insulin, that's how it's done. Now, if I'm on a basal bolus regimen, I'm going to be not only doing my correction factor, but I'm also going to be calculating my carbs. So if uh, before I eat, I do my correction factor, then I look at my meal and I say, this meal has so however many carbs in it, and this is how much insulin I take and I need to add. So it's correction plus carb ratio and that's how I calculate my insulin. So here, your, your insulin is standardized. You're gonna be taking about the same for every single meal. The hospital insulin is the same. And that can lead, especially if your meals aren't standardized, if the carbs vary between your meals, to less glycemic control. Here, I'm, I'm correcting for the carbs. Even though it's more calculation, I'm gonna receive a better glycemic control in the end. And ultimately better outcomes because of the good glucose control. And here on the bottom, I have a little graph showing uh, different types of rapid and basal and bolus combinations that are commonly given in sliding scale and basal bolus. So uh, here are different sliding scale arrangements. I have my rapid acting guys here, which are given before meals and their effect goes up and wears off quickly. And then my long acting guy here. So they're different combinations. These are kind of standard. So they're used in multiple combinations. And this is a different one with regular. It's also a more rapid acting one. 
And here are my long acting ones, which I have to dose every so often. Here at Glargin, you see it lasts almost the whole time. Uh, Detamir, you need to give twice. And then NPH, because it's the most rapid of the long ones, it needs to be given multiple times. All right, so I hope this uh, video was helpful for you guys. And I'll see you in the next one.